Silas, how goes it? No, not bad. How, how's you? Can't complain. Nobody will listen. You, you know how it is. So our our, um, <clears throat> our last discussion, uh, we were talking about uh, postmodernism and the angle it might have had in, in, with regard to psychological warfare in that you're creating a false reality where people people are trying to assess the world around them and they're constantly being fed with disinformation, false information, misleading information. And one of the... What I wanted to, to kind of mention to you is this kind of concept of political energy, grassroots energy, right? So in any, any, any given society, there is political movement and that that sweeps through the populace like uh wildfire which catches and it might gr grow to an inferno or it might burn out but it's a natural a natural force within society uh various political leanings and trends um uh, beliefs uh leaders emerge uh uh you know conflict happens between one group and another as it were but much of it uh traditionally was natural i.e it, it wasn't manufactured so as we looked around into the political landscape around us good bad or indifferent we could kind of hopefully say that well at least it's natural it's coming because this person this group of people believe this and this opposing uh group of people have a different set of beliefs and ergo the two of them are in conflict and that conflict will eventually uh, normalize or it will deteriorate into perhaps warfare uh, and or they may compromise. But like it seems, Silas, in, in the world we're in right now, that we seem to have a lot of organizations, sort of belief systems and perhaps individuals of all various different types and trends that are representing, uh, as Alan Partridge would have said, a political hot potato, but that much of it is is uh, manufactured, and it is not actually coming from any grassroots sense, and, and and it's 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 been driven from above, as it were. Have you any thoughts on that? Or oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really went from a cult of personality to a cult of perceptionality, and that is the cult's main modus operandi. I think. Post data and at least the, the, the sort of German peasant wars and the religious wars throughout Europe, where we saw, you know, this this sort of Hegelian dialectic, or just in, in its, itself, this balkanization, this dialectical type of warfare, where to defeat the enemy, one divides up the enemy into sort of internalized factions. Usually these are simple, you know, right, left, black, white, gay, straight, Protestant or counter-reformation, so Protestant or Catholic. You know, these sorts of really divisive psychological warfare that tears asunder the nation. So, of course, it is a way to destroy the nation internally and through a subtle way. But uh, primarily, it, it's also to bring in from the said, you know, the, the subsequent violence from that between these two camps is to bring in new social norms as another fantastic benefit of this tactic. But we, we even see it within the contemporary world as well. For example, COINTELPRO and Operation Chaos from the late 60s to the early 70s, the, the CIA and somewhat the FBI as well. There were some FBI resources used as well. They were engaged in counter espionage against their own people it's the same sort of they were they were creating controlled opposition in essence cointel pro is a sort of abbreviation a composite term which literally means counterintelligence program so th this this occurred with every group both left and right primarily it was it was against the black panther movement but you know in, in recent years we've we've even saw it be similar tactics used against for example, nationalist movements. Charlottesville would be an example of that. January 6th would be another example. They've also distorted a lot of the, the, the radical left, you know, the true grassroots movement. Radical left in areas such as Oregon and the West Coast, obviously via Antifa. There's certain rumours, I mean, it is disputed, but 
supposedly the Obama administration were bringing in, in essence, ISIS operatives, which again was another dialectic that was being created over in the Middle East. So it was a sort of external psychological warfare tactic that was being used there. A lot of these ISIS operatives were brought back and were embedded with an Antifa. Again, they, they, they're called ISIS operatives, but they're probably intelligence agency assets of some kind. But yes, this is this, this is the sort of war that they wage, both domestically and against foreign adversaries. You have to recall too that the supposed Hegelian dialectic, the triadic form or the triadic dialectic, was only revived by Hegel in the 18th century. Prior to that, we see that the Hegelian dialectic or the triadic dialectic, more precisely, was found within Kabbalah. Now again, this, this goes extremely extremely far back into antiquity, all the way back to Sumer and Babylon, we see the tradic dialectic occur within their mythologies. However, we see within Lurianic Kabbalah that the Hegelian dialectic found its origin in the modern sense. This was roughly around the early 16th century. However, funnily enough, he went by in religious circles the name Haari, this is extremely close to the name Harari, thus Yuval Noah Harari, the quasi-intellectual scholar that discusses transhumanism, dataism, and inorganic intelligence, in essence reaching that Adam Kadmon state, which is a part of the Tikkun, the Tikkun Olam, the world of rectification as we spoke of. Harari literally means the lion, so obviously the, the lion of Judah. However, he stated that all matter, and by extension, thought and spirit, was created via a tradic structure. This was, as he stated, the simsum, or the contraction, that would be similar to the thesis or problem. Then came the shivrit hakalim. Again, this is very much linked to the etiology, or the beginning of the cosmos within the ideas of Kabbalah. And then comes the Shivrat Hakalim, or the antithesis, the breaking of the vessels, or the reaction. And then comes the synthesis, which he stated was Tikkun, which is similar to the Kabbalistic term Tikkun Olam, or the world of rectification, the world that is repaired, rectified similar to the Soviet concept of normalization. Everything we see now is thus to bring in that world of normalization, that world of tikkun, that world of rectification. And that is the, the synthesis or the solution, problem, reaction, solution, formula. So yes, it's, this is all Kabbalistic. Uh, so... Right off the bat, it's incredibly complex. I mean, this is in order for one to kind of find out what is what's real here. It it, it requires a huge leap of analysis, and it's almost subjective, right? Depending on on which side of the war you're on, as to what is real and what is not. It, like it's it's almost as if the whole thing's up for grabs in a sense. Yeah, it, is, it does take a great deal of interpretation. We can't say this for certain. I mean, this is merely my interpretation based on everything we see within society and some tidbits here and there of information. But obviously they're never going to... The, the main the mainstay uh, de, sort of defence of a psychological operation is that it is concealed, it's hidden. It's obfuscated from the view of, of the target. People don't really realise, and, and this is the... This is the sort of advantage of using this type of tactic. Once you create these camps if you, and, and, and you set out the, the sort of rigid dogma via the controlled opposition leaders of these said camps, once you set out this rigid dogma, this doctrine, if anyone deviates from that, so if I was to go to, I don't know, a Trump supporter and say, listen, Trump is essentially, essentially the, the, the Trump campaign is a replay of the Soviet Union's Operation Trust. If I was to say that to, to them, you would have the ideological barriers go up right away because I've said something heretical to their beliefs, to the ideological dogma of that created artificial group. Likewise, if I was to say the same about Antifa or any of, any of their leaders, you know, discussing that Antifa is, in essence, 
a controlled opposition group and was created as such within the US, or the US branch was, that is, I'd be met, met with the same sort of ideological resistance. And this is the problem. And these ideologies are self-regulating. Thus, that is the problem. It is the main central problem of this. And it's extremely difficult to persuade, or again, to bring to reason an individual that is infected with an ideology, especially a simplistic dialectical ideology based on two rigid camps. Because it will always, and this is a sort of trope of human behaviour, humans will always seek to moralise politics, military endeavours, even economics, that if you oppose their ideas, it is easier for a human, because we're always looking for explanations, it's easier for a human to explain away your difference, explain away a difference in ideology, or a difference in ideas rather, based around morality, that they are good and, well, you are evil, that is why you differ from them. It is easier for a human to do that than to say, of an open mind, reason, be neutral upon a position, endeavour to seek out the pros and cons of each position, ironically, dialectical reasoning, and then from that come to a, a, a well-rounded position, probably taking points from both camps and thus synthesising it into a, a, a larger idea or concept that probably is closer to the truth because it is the middle ground. However, humans tend to take the path of least resistance. It's easier to engage in using a straw man argument and to literally boil down the, the debate to good versus bad. Again, psychological controllers know this. This is why they create simplistic dialectical divides and political and ideological camps and to pit them against one another. This is the easiest way to sow internal division within a nation, a target nation, and to thus weaken and destroy it over a gradual, long-term period. And these types of tactics are protracted, meaning they, I mean they go on for generations. We're already seeing it. This type of tactic, directly, has been in use, in America at least, since the sexual revolution, so the early 1960s. Th th this is the type of time frame that we're talking about here. And this is how long it takes to weaken the nation. Even the word ideology, I mean it is a euphemism. These, these are cults that the intelligence agencies are creating. They're weaponized cults. And, and they're used against the other side. It's, it's really to embroil society into a, a distraction, a war of distraction, if you will, where they dehumanise the other. And, and in a way, it, it, it does create, the, it does furnish the chaos to facilitate, again, the changing of social norms, a sort of radical reformation of society. Well, like, if we're, if we're being played all the time, with this kind of stuff are we better off to not have an opinion because it seems to me like that the dialectic elicits an emotional response uh, you know for or against any given topic or, or political agenda or whatever it may be so in a sense is is the is the the modern person better off not to have an opinion and better off not to react and to see it for what it is and to just gingerly uh, take a step back and quietly you know, slide out the back door on, the, on with regard to some of these topics. Because it seems to me that if, if you have an opinion, you're sort of owned, you're psychologically owned in some way, and that you're, you know, your next step is, has been predicted and you've been funneled along in some predetermined route. And, uh, you know, so you're kind of better off in a way not to have an opinion with a lot of modern stuff, a lot of modern how do you say, the political agendas and rights-based movements and political, like if, if they are controlled. You make a fantastic point. I, I would say the reason the internet was created was to facilitate these types of 
ideological camps. I mean, people, again, this is the problem. It's easier to fool someone than to convince them they have been fooled. I mean, even myself, even you as well, all of us, we have been infected to some degree. Our perception has been altered, shifted in some way by what we viewed on the internet. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a definite, even if we don't believe it. The internet really was set up to provide the illusion of resistance between any ideological, you know, within any ideological camp. So Antifa uses it, they put, put out their various uh, spin on things, the right wing use it, they put their various spin on things, and all of these other groups, these sort of sub dialectics, if you will, Protestant and Catholic, Christian and Muslim, Jew and Muslim, you know, whatever, whatever these dialectics that they, they create to divide people. And you, you see the debate, most of, most of the debate, by the way, on social media now is totally controlled. They insert via bots, comments or posts, pushing the, the narrative in a certain direction. Again, it's all to cause friction, to cause chaos between two opposing diametric camps that they have created. So primarily, and this is where it gets, it's quite a, a, quite a, a jump in, in perception for a lot of people. These dialectics, the right and the left, needlecraft and non-needlecrafted, it's not that either, you know, either side is right or wrong, or that we shouldn't have an opinion if, and, or, you know, if we have an opinion, well, automatically we're in one of these camps. It's not really that. What it comes down to is the friction that we have amongst our peer group on these various issues most of it is obviously created by the media. By us doing that, we're actually defending the international establishment. We're defending it. Because while we're busily attacking each other over baseless, senseless minutia, they are busily, totally unabated, you know, without any resistance against them, putting into place their new international system. So personally myself, I think the internet was, in, was designed, was proliferated to, to the... The, the world for, for this main reason, to push these dialectics, to push this sort of psychological warfare onto the people directly. Because everyone is, is constantly within this arena now. So they're, they're now, as we're seeing from, from the advent of the internet, we've saw a balkanization culturally, socially, politically. I mean, it's got to the point now where you have people literally shooting other people on the street primarily in America, because one supports Trump and the other, you know, I don't know, supports Antifa or, you know, left-wing politics or what have you. It's, it's insane. But that's been allowed, it's been facilitated by the psychological manipulators, the, the cult of perceptionality, if you will. Mm -hmm. But there, there seems to be like a, a key psychological aspect to this stuff in that it, it seems to be natural, Silas, that we'll speak to one another on a given topic where, where we're trying to arrive at an opinion. It could be any given topic. It could be a matter of politics. It could be a personal matter. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, a, a, some si sort of a scientific answer we're, tr we're trying to arrive at. But it seems that, Silas, for example, you and I on the, on the call here right now will speak to one another with a view to ironing out the creases in what we're thinking about, trying to detangle difficult areas and arriving at consensus, some degree of consensus. And like I think that term consensus is linked into what Gramsci called common sense, i.e. this herd instinct of what is normative, what do we accept as being real, rational, reasonable and determinable and true. So it's it's... It's as if that mechanism has been apprehended to, and has been manipulated to astounding effect, to a degree of mastery, and to the point where the world, uh, as is de depicted to the, the masses, is, is done so through a series of smoke and mirrors and a camera obscura and a kaleidoscope of conflicting inf information disinformation uh, you know sidetracking creation of dialectics the focusing of attention into the big sort of 
political, the big hot potatoes, like the ones we're all so well used to at this stage, Co- uh, climate, um, the uh, the mass health event that we've had in the last couple of years, for example. Um, but it, it, it seems that, um, it, I think it ties back a little bit to our conversation around the Kabbalah, that there's this sense of reality itself has been through the, the realm of the, the Samael aspect of the cliff off. It, it has, reality has been smashed into a million pieces and reimagined by the, the master sorcerers. And that the, the public or the masses seem to be at a loss or are, 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 you know, somehow enslaved, psychologically enslaved by this stuff. So is there, I wonder, is there any way for, for the average Joe or Jill out there to kind of break free from this stuff? Or are they somehow imprisoned by it, caught in the web, so to speak? I, I would say mentally one can break free of it merely by seeing it. Once you see it, it becomes largely childish. I mean, you, you see it for what it is. Once we rise above these dialectics, that is when true change will come. It won't come by supporting Trump or supporting Antifa or supporting, you know, this camp or that camp that's being created for us. And we're all funneled into it because, again, these these individuals are, in essence, rhetoricians. That's all they are. They're, they're speaking platitudes that most people wish to hear. They're telling you what you want to hear to increase your disposition towards them. That's exactly it. And in turn, you will subscribe to whatever they're, they're saying and you will follow them as your leader. So we need to get beyond that. Funnily enough, this this even goes into postmodernism. Mikhail Foucault, rather famous, I, I, he's pretty much the, the quintessential postmodernist thinker of the 20th century, I would say. But he discusses this idea of, again, heterotopia, where it's a sort of continuation of his ideas regarding biopower. I'll touch on biopower in a, in a, in a minute, but heterotopia is cultural or institutional, a, a systematic space in which it, it, it feels alien or feels othered to the the individual viewing it. You know, it's disturbing, it's, it's insane, feels contradictory or incompatible. He stated this was potentially, and he only discusses it briefly, he states that this, this is potentially another example of biopower. So biopower is, in essence, and I think I touched upon it in our, our last discussion, in essence, it's the, it's the practices and the methodology by which governments, religious institutions, social constructs and institutions, even markets and monetary institutions as well, any sort of hierarchical structure is how it maintains power amongst its subordinates. And it's how not even physically controlling them, but controlling their, their very innate biology, their mental space, essentially. Foucault sees these differences in techniques as, a, as nothing more than behavioural control technologies. And modern biopower is nothing more than a series of webs and networks working its way around the societal body. So that's very similar to the metaphysical Lurianic way of viewing the cliff off. Which would be, you know, the shells or husks that surround holiness, or, or the, you know, the sacred inner sanctum. It's similar, similar in vain, you know, that these dialectics are that series of webs and networks that are created. The mutually complementary, yet paradoxical forces of nature. That is that which creates a shell or a husk around the inner societal body, the, the, the establishment, the, the control structure. He, he continues on. Genocide is indeed the dream of modern power. This is not because of the recent return to the ancient right to kill. It is because power is situated and exercised at the level of life, the species, the race, and the large-scale phenomena of the population. So in essence, what he's saying there is genocide is another technique of biopower. It can be used to control large-scale populations, control their, their mind, control their spirit, and obviously control them physically as well. He states as well, groups identified as the threat to the existence of the life of the nation or of humanity can be eradicated with impunity, according to Foucault. He continues on, I mean, it's the, the sort of same fascistic demagoguery, one could say. Where, where does like Foucault arrive... Like, is he trying to map, uh, you know, tyranny 
for the power structure? Is he trying to call? This is how. This is how. This is how you should roll if you're trying to run the world. Like, or is he, is he merely observing, or did he have some sort of a, you know, Marxist mandate, or what's driving him in this into this interest area? I wonder. Or is there any was there any clue in that in your in your travels, study wise? That's a superb question. He writes it like he's just observing it, like it's critique, critical theory, which obviously we've discussed. You know, is is a sort of mainstay. It's very integral to postmodernism. It is postmodernism, the, the you know the theory of uh, critique or critical theory. But I mean, honestly, the way you write, sometimes it, it's almost it's almost how you think of a fascist demagogue or a communist dictator or what have you, you know, sitting around thinking, how will I rule the world? <laughs> it's almost like that. It's very similar to Plato's The Republic, where he discusses the Calipolis, the in essence the aristocratic regime that he wishes to create and they're sitting there and they're pontificating about you know how will the world look how how can we keep the peasants in line it's it's very similar very similar i would say and in his writing style but again I, i'm not reading the original uh, french I, i'm reading a, a translation into english so it may it may come across different in french than than it will in, in the english translation but I get that sort of sense at times that it goes beyond critique. It, it seems like he's aiding and abetting, <laughs> if you will, the cabal in charge, an intellectual of it. Yeah, and uh, like it, it, a little bit springs to mind uh, about uh, another academic from the I don't know, maybe a post war warrior, Gramsci, and he, he, as far as I remember, he had this theory around hegemony, which was to do with how how power was maintained, how how it got to where it needed to be and what it had to do to, to stay there, etc. So, like, there's, like, a whole slew of academics out there who are, and intellectuals who are just completely obsessed with figuring out how to uh, rule the world and how to subjugate the masses and how to, it, it seems. But I'm guessing a lot of them arrived out of the Marxist camp originally, that there was, uh, like, the... the, the um, the Frankfurt School, for example, Marx had predicted the collapse of society when when the, the, the sort of inequality, the class structure became apparent after mass capitalism. It was going to be a big massive revolution and communism would, you know, take hold or whatever. But that didn't happen. So, so uh, I think we spoke about this in the last conversation, but like the Frankfurt School then was set out to, to try and discover why didn't that happen? And this is where it gets a little bit confusing because one of the one of the reasons that they they apparently we get the gentleman's name uh, was that this is Marcusa, right? Um, and these uh, these people, uh, Felix Fein, Eric Fromm, Herbert Marcusa, Horkenheimer, all these dudes. Benjamin, Theodore Adorno, there's, there's a whole bunch of them well-known academics, um, Jürgen Habermas. But one, Horkenheimer was the guy who said that the one of the reasons why the uh, revolution didn't happen was, was because the, uh, the masses were, were comprised of what we call NPCs, uh, or, you know, just empty people who were... Inert consumers devoid of free will, and they had to use his. Like you've heard this term, right, Silas? Uh, NPC. You know, it's a kind of a dig at the, at the average Joe Normie in society who, who's just been subjected to whatever's going on around him, uh, and is kind of inert. His his will is paralyzed, and he's he is a a, re a receptor for inputs uh, to, you know, then generate predetermined outputs. So he's almost become like completely devoid of any persona. But the, uh, Horkenheimer had a term for this. Was called, he called it standardization. So that's the posh term for NPC. So next time you hear someone say, oh, it's the NPCs, you say, no, well, that's standardization. That's the correct, the correct term from the Frankfurt School. But it seems that Horkenheimer initially was looking at society and was critical. He was critical of standardization and you know quote unquote he they insist on the ide ideology which enslaves them 
And he blamed the culture industry, what he termed the culture industry, i.e. mass culture, media, uh, what you might, at the, ter- the start of the conversation, I mean, what, what, what determines what's culture? For example, our, our dialectic nodes, as it were, such as the medical emergency, the climate emergency, um, you know, right wing versus left wing, uh, gender identities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are, are largely now nodes which kind of compromise what you might call consciousness in, in modern society. But it, the point I want to make is that he, Horkenheimer seems to look at these things and he's frustrated. He's going, why is my communist uh, revolution not happened? And it's because, and he says, well, it's the NPCs are watching too much TV. And <laughs> so he then, they then, the Frankfurt School decides to, well, how, what can we do to reinvigorate society? To, with a view to eventually getting the the um, communist revolution to happen worldwide, well, what we'll do is we will stir the shit, and how we will do that is we will engage on what they call the tyranny of the minority. So that's where you get to your dialectic stuff. So all of a sudden, you're looking for anywhere in society there's a fracture line, and some of the more obvious ones are gender and race. But less obvious ones may be along the lines of the sick and the healthy. You know, you can exploit that. So how would you exploit that? Well, the healthy ones might have received a dose of some medication that has been administered to alleviate the symptoms of some uh, disease which has spread around the world, for example. Or you might have a dialectic which is along the lines of those who are living in a world where the climate is functioning normally, <laughs> you're not, you know. So now the dialectic has gotten postmodernist as well. It's not so obvious, you know. It's it's traditionally along national border lines or along religious fault lines, but now it could be anything. It could be anything at all. Oh, absolutely. You you even have ableist now. That if you are not disabled, if you are able, you make any comment whatsoever regarding disability from your point of supposed privilege that that you are engaging in a microaggression this is the insanity of it all they, they find these these fault lines within society every society has them they're they're natural and they tear tear at them they chip away at them they expand the the, the chasm and from that fissure of division they then extract you know again Chaos. It's all about chaos. These individual, you know, Operation Chaos, another name for COINTELPRO. Pro. That's exactly what these individuals are all about. That's how they create and maintain the society, uh, and how they're going to, they think, achieve their their scientific as a scientific dictatorship. And call it a crypto plutocracy. You know, neo neo feudalism, stakeholder capitalism. It really comes down to it's a scientific dictatorship maintained and ran by algorithms that's essentially it's essentially that's what they want i think this goes way 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 back i don't i don't know if we can touch on it very briefly here but i I keep seeing even from the early renaissance humanists specifically from the camp of uh, cosimo de medici so this is around about the 1460s or so and this is post-dating a lot of the occult and ancient writings that were beginning to trickle back into Europe, you know, the hermetic works, a lot of these various occult writings. So the humanist movement began to develop there. There was many late Byzantine scholars that fled Constantinople at that point in time. Obviously, very it was extremely close to the eventual sack of Constantinople and annexation by the Turks in 14. 14- 54. But we have this individual called Gemistos Lethon. Now, a very interesting fellow indeed, but I, he created a book called The Book of Laws, which is obviously quite quite similar to Alistair Crowley's The Book of the Law. But he discusses this. I'm just going to get the quote. It's very interesting indeed, because it links quite inclusively with Al- Aldous Huxley's quote that was posited by Timothy Leary in the 1960s. Here we go. So this is from George of Trebizond's account that was detailed within his work, Comparatio Platonis et Aristoteles, volume 63. 
So he states regarding Gemistos Plethon, this late Byzantine scholar that fled to essentially Tuscany under the, the protection of Cosimo de' Medici. He stated, quote, I myself heard him at Florence, this is George of Trebizond saying, asserting that in a few more years the whole world would accept one and the same religion with one mind and one intelligence and one teaching or dogma. And when I asked him, would it be Christ or Muhammad? He said, neither, but it will not differ much from paganism. So he continues on that he was shocked by this and he called him a po poisonous viper and he feared him. I heard too from a number of Greeks who escaped here from the Peloponnese that he openly said before he died, Gemistos that is, that not many years after his death, Muhammad and Christ would collapse and the true truth would shine through every region of the globe, unquote. But I thought that very... Interesting. Obviously, it links with the Georgia Guidestones and this idea of the age of reason. You know, Planck 3 writes, quote, unite humanity with a living new language, which, you know, is very similar to the sort of Tower of Babel thing. But there's this idea that Timothy Leary, I think everyone should be fairly familiar with Timothy Leary, the godfather of the hippie movement, the late 60s, totally linked with the CIA, by the way. He was based out of Harvard University Psychology Department, who worked there for quite some time. He worked with Huxley, Aldous Huxley. Funnily enough, Huxley also worked with the cybernetic movement in the Macy Conference. So there's a link there between cybernetics, between what you were discussing there, and obviously the hippie, the counterculture movement of the 60s. But Leary states, uh, he's quoting Huxley here, quote, These brain drugs mass-produced in the laboratories will bring about vast changes in society. This will happen with or without you or me. All we can do is spread the word. The obstacle to this evolution, Timothy, is the Bible. Leary then added, We had run up against the Judeo-Christian commitment to one God, one religion, one reality, that has cursed Europe for centuries and America since our founding days. Drugs that open the mind to multiple realities inevitably lead to a polytheistic view of the universe. We sensed at the time for a new humanist religion so again, this humanist idea again, based on intelligence, good-natured pluralism, and scientific paganism had arrived, unquote. So I, I found it very strange because I was, I was writing a section of my book today and I, I just found it that very strange. Again, it seems like this is what they're going for. Uh, even from the MK Ultra experimentations within primarily beginning after World War II, you begin to see, and, and also the counterculture movement, I mean, even even the LSD that was being given out at Altamont Free Concerts, 1969, about 300,000 people, but yeah, the CIA were there, they were giving out free LSD, and there with clipboards in hand and taking photographs of what it was doing to people as well, and recording what it was doing to people. So it's it really is based around how to control people's minds. I think we're, we're entering the new frontier of that. I mean, you're even seeing it with Harari and what he's stating. I think they're, they don't just want to control the narratives of society and thus subjugate people through that. I think the new, far more predictable method is via direct control, via pharmacological means, as Huxley uh, envisioned, or via, you know, biodigital implants, as Harari states, and Klaus Schwab as well. Not at all, not at all. Um, paganism and the New Age movement and the eventual manifestation of a one world religion, like, that's a huge topic. But um, can you, to tie it in, I suppose, firstly, to to our idea around the dialectic, that we have these dialectic nodes in, in, in modernity, we can quickly see that, you know, that the possibility for the ultimate dialectic it, the, between good and evil. So that, you know, in, in, order, in other words, to arrive at a one world religion, we would need a massive chaotic event, uh, conflict event along the lines of revelations where there's something absolutely huge goes down and everybody goes into a huge panic and the average Joe or Jill is presented with a solution and uh, the solution is this uh, one world religion uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here right that's exactly it. yeah it's, an, it's a new theology that's what they're wishing to bring in so so like we like br very briefly like 
uh, some of Steiner's, Rudolf Steiner's stuff on, and I hate to use the term because it's, it's so cliched and everybody has a, a viewpoint on it at this stage. It's so cliched to the point that you can't even really speak about it in a lot of ways. But Rudolf Steiner spoke quite a bit about uh, Freemasonry. And the reason I'm bringing up Freemasonry and, and eventually Theosophy is that the is, as I see it, Silas, so correct me if I'm wrong, the essential spiritual elements or teachings of what we might loosely term the proto-new religion will be coming from that realm as such. In other words, the, the general, what it's going to look like is coming from that world, coming from those teachings and that kind of outlook. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Yeah, in, in essence, yes. It, it, I would say, I would say though that was a source of euphemism or a, merely a social primer for what's to come. So so it was made to look in essence happy dippy, you know, <laughs> to use a slang term. It was made to look very you know, well uh, you know peace and love. That's what they use. They're not going to come come in goose stepping, but in essence that's exactly what they're they're wishing to do. But but it's also very attractive, is is it not? In a lot of ways, it's it's not. There's the hippy dippy element, but there's also the kind of the John D. scrying in the mirror and you know contacting spirits and you know receiving messages from distant stars like the Tool Society and you know the tarot and and ripping open the fabric of reality and that we're all be like Huxley. We're all going to become master mag magicians sorcerers etc and it's just very attractive you know this sounds to me like uh, uh you know what's his name harry <laughs> you know harry potter right it's like we're all gonna have a little kind of a, a capacity here to mess with reality that we we, we won't just have to kind of simply sit back and uh, enjoy the, the world that god has put us in so to speak but we will now be able to uh manipulated to our own end but i think that's one of the core differences here isn't it between what we might have loosely termed the ordinary uh hard-working god-fearing kind of approach the new approach will be it, it seems um it will be attractive in lots of ways am i right in saying that oh yeah it'll be it'll be temptation via convenience of which any new technology and the advent of any new technology is, is brought in via that. But yes, it's it'll be a sort of techno paganism, techno utopianism. That's the term I, I am using within my new book. Just you know, to be very broad, sort of broad term. But that's exactly it. They're they're going to use technology to in essence create a a, a singular unified mind. An internet of bodies, literally. That will be the new religion. That's how they're going to... So, whereas the, the Nazis were obsessed with this kind of a folkloric, paganist, um, you know, Odin and this kind of ancient pagan kind of out in the woods with, uh, you know, messing with the runes and kind of, you know, dealing with the old gods. And it, it, it all seemed... But it was tied in with the... With the with blood, right? Blood and race, all these kinds of words and terminology. Whereas, as you see it, the new version 2.0 will be tied in with technology. So it will be a pagan technology, right? Or, or technology that is apprehended and, and is moving into the old sensibilities, as it were. So a marriage of the ancient world and, and the modern, or the future world. Is that how you see it? Yes, yes. I, I think they're they're going to do away with this idea of a singular unitary god. In essence, it will be much akin to sort of the Olympians. But the Olympians will be, in essence, them. That will be the new religion. They will be gods among mere mortals. I know it sounds absolutely insane, but uh, we we have to recall, you know, some of the mo <laughs> some of the most well attested to intellectuals of this day. You know, Yuval Noah Harari he constantly, constantly touted as some sort of a visionary in the World Economic Forum. The rich and powerful are singing his praises. He states that the rich, the, I mean the super, super wealthy, 
that basically the, the rulers of this system, the ones uh, with the levers, that, that control the lever of credit, provide us the privilege of having an economy and a society, according to them. They wish to, to enact this sort of new system. They, they become the Olympians, if you will. But is, is, it, is it not like a rehash of the empire psychology of old, in that we, we brought, we being the imperialists, brought... Uh, colonize it, civilization to the uh, unruly natives. You know, we, we brought them God and we brought them the roads and the bureaucracy and the forms they had to fill in and the normalcy of, you know, leading a good suburban life. But is it, is there, is there not, <laughs> is it not that somebody, whoever ends up doing that, whoever ends up running the show automatically seems to head into this hubris and decay and kind of, almost psych psychological mania that it, it seems to be that they can't, that it, it doesn't exist without it. Oh yeah, and then you'll never find a Cincinnati. I mean, that does, it just doesn't exist. The story of Cincinnati, of which he, he was a farmer, uh, or this is the mythology, he was a farmer. He was given a dictatorship of, of Rome, total, total unwavering authority to, to vanquish the enemies of Rome. And after the war was concluded, and obviously it ended in a Roman victory, the army told him to, in essence, stay on as imperator. But he relinquished power and you know, went back to ways of humility. But you, you will never find that in this society. No, you're absolutely correct. They, they decay. It's all, it becomes very egoic. They become slaves to their ego, to their hubris. It is. The, 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 this is the Tower of Babel story. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane to think. But you, you, it, 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 when we speak about these in this area, I feel like we're a, a, like for each individual or think tank that we speak about, or government agency that we might speak about, um, or religion, or any any subject kind of area, that we like that we have to. I feel like I have to take a step back and be like the sentry at the gate, and I have to say halt, friend or foe. So, for example. Like, like with an organization like the CIA in America. So ostensibly, you're speaking about the Secret Service, right? So and any decent nation state in the modern world uh, will have a Secret Service. And, you know, they'll be tasked with one might naively think defending the, the interests of the nation state and the people in it. And so, like... From what you're from what you're saying there in in the sixties, uh, you know, etc. CIA were active actively involved in spying on their own people. Um, potentially, you could say at war with their own people. Is 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 that an exaggeration to say that? Or oh no, they they are. That's that's the whole point of any standing army. Any standing army is is to be used against the domestic population first, because they are the main enemy. I mean, I know that it'll come across as absolutely uh, preposterous to people, but as uh, the pop domestic population is the main enemy, especially an armed domestic population is, is the main enemy to, to the government and their maintaining of control, power and monopoly over those, uh, over control and, you know, power, of which both really are synonymous, I, I guess. But, yes. Yeah, but but if we dissect that kind of thinking, right? Uh, we're, we're and if we look into government departments, you see, largely our government is made up of elected representatives, people who serve a couple of terms in office, who have went for public election, uh, election in the public domain, etc. And or we have our civil servants, people who are, you know, salaried people who spent twenty or thirty years in their various government departments. Uh, working away on the on the bureaucracy of the machine, etc. So where is this brain that would set the dogs on the, on its own people? Like where is this mind located? Is it somewhere within society, or is there another government deeply at play, or is there a, a third wheel spinning somewhere in the west, and uh, or is is this a natural? state of affairs with regard to power. Am I naive to think that this has never been the case or 
is is the well-informed person aware that this has always been the case in, in that there's always been government agencies who have kept a very close eye like a watchdog on 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 its own population primarily in government is is created for and and by special interests primarily moneyed interests yeah, the merchant classes they, they are the especially in a republic and any, this this is the sort of irony of it especially if in a republic you will find the merchant class are right there they they can they create the government they control the government they are the government obviously within a democracy that plutocracy becomes a sort of crypto plutocracy a, a hidden a hidden rule by the wealthy you know the captains of finance of industry and what have you they put in power and and believe me they do i have absolutely no faith in any of these elections i think they're really they are selections c- uh, they're not elections but they're all put in power by special interest groups for the special interests of these special interest groups i i would say as well in terms of how it's set up the bureaucracy has most of the power most of the control they do most of the thinking and most of the, the they, they turn the motions of the machine in, t- in terms of heading towards the destination of the agenda of the said special interest groups the elected officials that we see so that being the, the ones within the legislative bodies the judiciary be it a you know a bicameral or a tricameral system and with especially the executive they are all bought and paid for they are merely salesmen it's a sort of zoo of rhetoricians that's what these chambers are they're monkeys that wear suits and ties and are there to sell you what the bureaucracy is doing the bureaucracy is only doing what they've been told to do by their primarily their leadership the leadership is then funded bribed backed supported some sort of potentially not a legal way <laughs> but uh, one could say an immoral way by these special interest groups that's how it works it's the entire system is as a whole functions as is a holarchy that's exactly how it works within all of these various groups and governments obviously when you get to the top it becomes far more mechanistic or standard in its hierarchical structure and at the top you will have collection of families because that's the way our society is set up nepotism rules and hereditary dynasties specifically within positions of office are absolutely rampant the wheels or the, the machine of politics is merely greased by the, the oil of of currency whoever controls the currency controls the legislative bodies and also the bureaucracy they control the entire society honestly because they look, they control the means of exchange and logistical distribution of food water infrastructure civic buildings private enterprise i mean nothing really happens we don't have an economy with, without their blessing or curse their privilege that they've you know most graciously bestowed upon us of credit of this fiat currency obviously they wish to reinforce that buttress that and in turn buttress their position via the new cbd c system they wish to bring in well are you are you telling me that um my political hero might be an actually actually a paid shill you know for example if if i think that uh, mr mr trump uh, might have been you know a maverick who was going to upset the entire uh, political system in america and you know, drain the swamp, get rid of all the bad guys and stand up for the likes of me, little guy. So are you telling me that he was just a one man marketing campaign, a shill? Is that your is that your opinion? Oh absolutely, yeah. I, well look, look at Trump. He was bankrupt eight times. Next you'll be telling me there's no Santa Claus now. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well well Trump as well. I mean he was bankrupt I think it was eight times. And then he still went he still went on to get, you know, huge loan. Well like you know in order for, in order for in order for a guy, in order for a guy like that to be to have arrived at where he arrived, if your theory is correct, he must have had some fairly interesting connections along the way. You know, he must have had, uh, and I believe one of his, um, he was a protege of Mr. Roy Cohn, who was a well-known uh, lawyer in New York back in the day. And probably not any old lawyer, because Mr. Cohen represented the Rosenbergs. Uh, I tried the, Re- the Rosenbergs at the time that um, nuclear weapons were 
stolen by the Soviets and all of a sudden America and Russia had access to nuclear weapons. A footnote to that comment, if nuclear weapons indeed exist, but that's a story for another day. But, uh, Mr. Yeah. May, may I add um, just something no, to ahead. that as well? Sorry to interject. Again, it's absolutely, if, if they, you know, footnote to that, if they do exist, but again, it's all, it's all the narrative, isn't it? It's that again, that in and of itself, the Cold War was the, you know, one of the main sort of external dialectics that they were creating to induce fear. And it also brought with it new and surprising changes to, to legislation and the legal traditions as well. Well, the other the other person that's speaking of the Cold War that uh, Roy Cohn represented was McCarthy, the Reds under the bed. Uh, McCarthy, you know, was a... You know, he had made a lot of charges that there was communists present in Washington at the time. And it was a big uh, star in the in the media at the time, and uh, Mr. Cohn, the same guy, represented him. So he, you know, he springs. He seems this guy Roy Cohn seems to spring up a lot. But the only reason I'm mentioning mentioning his name is that uh, he's also connected to Mr. Trump. And he takes a young Mr. Trump under his wing when Mr. Trump is involved in concrete in New York, way back in the day in the 80s. And he must have seen something in him. So we see these strange alliances from these characters in the political scene. Um, a lot of these, I don't know if you, if you have any uh, insight into Mr. Churchill, but it's, from what I understand, Mr. Mr. Churchill's career was, was on its knees. He was, a uh, poor man had a, problem with alcohol and uh, he was doing so well and uh, at some point in time before the second world war outbreak of the war he seems to have found friends in high finance and his career was propelled forward uh, so it seems like when and you know you're mentioning the cold war obviously cold war takes place after germany is destroyed so um National Socialism in Germany, you know, the, the Versailles Treaty is written, puts Germany on its knees economically, and suddenly, lo and behold, we have uh, Mr. Hitler, um, a low-ranking soldier of no not, you know, he's he's a nobody. He, what he was, a, he, he seemed to, uh, sorry to interject. Yeah, um, go ahead. Just as well, he, when he, ca he came back to Germany post-dating the war, he was working for, again, the intelligence apparatus within Germany, infiltrating sort of beer hall ideologies that were springing up. Again, the grassroots ideologies that were springing up. He was there to essentially be become the controlled opposition of these said groups, to lead them in a certain way. I know that will absolutely you know, be preposterous to, to, to many people that defend the man, but let's be clear. After that Munich Putsch of 1923, he should have been shot for treason. They did the same thing with the communists. Not not too long <laughs> prior to the Munich Putsch, uh, so they they they'd shot communists for treason summarily, pretty much. No, he was sent to Landau prison, basically under house arrest, and he could continue writing his material. How do you explain that? How does how does anyone explain that? And then they state, well, well, he died at the end of the war and all of this and all of that. There's another one. He had a singular chance to destroy all of the British and French forces at Dunkirk. And he didn't do it. Even after all of his generals told him, listen, let us just go in and just wipe them all out. It will basically put them out of the war. He said no, because the war was meant to drag on. It was meant to get to the destination that it was meant to get to. Just like this Russo-Ukraine war. It's meant to be prolonged, tracted, to thus justify changes. The mass, irrevocable changes within society and throughout the world. It was, it was all for social change. He was probably an agent of some kind. Did he, did he die? We didn't find a body. Supposedly the body was burnt. <laughs> prior to the to the allies getting there but we have the greatest conflict greatest in brackets worst conflict 
mankind has ever seen, where the greatest arch enemies, uh, the Free West and the Hulk of Communist USSR, meet face to face in Berlin. Two hulking armies, nose to nose, chin to chin. And what did they do? Try to obliterate each other? No. They sit down, they shake hands, they draw up documents, they build a wall in the middle of the city, and they keep it cool. And that's what they teach us in our history books, and no one bats an eyelid. And nobody says, hang on a second. These people were sworn enemies of, in, in terms of their ideology. So it it just, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't add up. But you're kind of insinuating there to go back to Mr. Hitler and co. Mr. Barman, Mr. Hess. Uh, these people are some very shady characters, like. And again, like, I think it's worth outlining. Uh, Mr. Hitler is a man who is a foot soldier, a corporal in the First World War, who has no career, no background. I mean, he's he's family were school teachers he was a like he's a nobody he's a failed art student this guy is not is a non-entity and he goes on to lead an army to try and take over europe and then russia and this we're taught this in school and no one like i mean do people turn around and say hang on a second the story is a little bit fishy it just seems odd you know what i mean Seems a little bit odd, and I hope you don't mind me saying, but there's something funny about this. It just doesn't seem to add up. Who is this guy? Where has he come from? Who has he fi- who has financed these armies? How has he arrived at this uh, situation? And I think it's, for me anyway, it's particularly with regard to World War II and Nazi Germany. When you ask that question, that's when a lot of stuff, uh, for me anyway, opened up. And my curiosity, because it to me the story stank, for want of a better way of putting it. You know, if if I was a policeman invite, investigating a, a crime, I would say something stank, something's rotten here, someone's not telling telling the truth or whatever. So, and and then you get into uh, a whole lot of what happened, and you start to see the whole the whole historical situation as a series of chess moves from within and without, uh, within being Hitler himself and National Socialism in Germany. Uh, you get to get the sense that it was part puppet organization and partly relying on the fervor of mass emotional response that was in turn um, prodded by, uh, you know, difficult economic circumstances and the tragedies of, 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 of war and a society that had been kicked into a corner. And uh, so the whole thing starts to seem like a case of glo- bullying on a global scale. And, you know, the inflicting of trauma, not just bullying, but like downright psychotic, anti-human hate. And the, if you start to look at history in, in this way, it is it is quite dark, I think, because, you know, you may begin to realize that in some respects, you might be better off to believe the story as, that, as it's told, because the reality may be quite darker, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we have this kind of concept that, uh, this idea that Europe at the time was in the grip of globe, the globalists, as it were, of international money, or the globe, the cabal, if you want to use that terminology. But that there were still elements within Europe who were part of the old, the old ways of of thinking, i.e., the, you know, the the, the the old familial kind of structures, and uh, one of the well-known events that happened pr- just prior to the outbreak of World War II was when Rudolf Hess uh, took a plane to Scotland and crash-landed a BF-110, I believe, in in Scotland. And he, he went up there on a one-man mission to try and speak to members of the royalty who he believed were still anti- anti-war and who had not been co-opted 
by uh, the cabal by international money and who he, he believed were still and I believe th- th- that what he wanted to offer was that Germany would be allowed to take her territories to a reasonable degree establish herself in Europe and that would be that and th- that Germany wanted no war with Britain however uh, that deal didn't work out Churchill was in the hands of the, uh, of the internationalists and they firmly did want a war with Germany and as they say, the rest is history. Now, what I've just told you is very controversial and by a lot of kind of conservative historians will staunchly disagree with what, what I've said as being factual. But the facts are that uh, Mr. Hess, who was the second in command in Germany at the time, did fly to Scotland to try to speak to somebody to try and, uh, you know, offer peace. But... um. The war machine was was thirsty for blood, and they wanted to, to destroy Britain. And the war machine wanted to completely destroy Germany. It would seem uh, to take her out of the the global kind of scenario forever, and they succeeded. They obliterated Germany, and n- not just national socialism, but they used national socialism and as an excuse to extinguish the German spirit forever. And that was their that was their perfect excuse, and they sowed the seed of that uh, national socialism themselves in Germany by by writing the uh, you know the, the the Versailles Treaty, which you know humiliated Germany and broke its economy and left her on her knees. So from within and without, <laughs> the puppet strings were there, you know, and at the same time, this international money moves into finance uh, Mr. Trotsky, a.k.a. Mr. Bronstein, and co. into Russia. Uh, I, uh, my current understanding on this is to get rid of the, the Tsar at the time and to uh, insert communism into Russia, the new system. And that was uh, to, the, to the tune of 60, 60 million Russian lives. That's 60 million uh, Russian l- people were murdered. Uh, during that conflict. We don't hear a whole lot about that. You know, we don't hear a whole lot about that. But uh, Mr. Stalin, real name, Jokas Vili, Mr. Trotsky, real name, Bronstein and co. And they're, uh, you know, my, my understanding is that they were agents of the International Brigade. They were agents of globalism, as we now know it. And my understanding is Mr. Mr. Churchill was also an agent of globalism. And Mr. Hitler and co., were also, uh, and my my feeling on it actually, Mr. Barman, who was, you know, uh, was, was certainly uh, at the time rumoured to be a spy. And so what you had all these characters playing one against the other, good guy, good cop, bad cop, which was all a crock of bullshit because at the top they were, they were all either directly agents of or controlled by um, f- international finance, globalism as we now know it. And when I use the term globalism, I mean, you know, something that does not have an alliance to humanity, uh, certainly doesn't have an alliance to any country, doesn't respect uh, uh, national boundaries or anything like that. And uh, as you said earlier on in the conversation, Silas, um, things like government are they're really just a front for this, for what we're talking about. And, uh, you know... I think it's our understanding is they have a big, a bigger picture, a much bigger picture. And uh, you meant, we spoke a little bit about it with this idea of religion. Uh, for example, we, like a, a universal economy, a universal religion, uh, perhaps a universal multicultural race, if you will. Um, what is, like... What what do you think this religion might look like, or what would be their motive for bringing it in, or um, how would it differ from anything we we know, know and recognize? Do you think uh, you mentioned this like the idea of uh, re- paganist technology, marriage between those two things? I mean, can you, could you talk a little bit more about that? Or? Well, well, since I, I would I would say I think they've they've reworked their idea or their vision for this, from the early days of the Renaissance humanists, around about the 1460s, 1470s, 
I think it's developed a lot more since then, you know, as, as I mentioned, Mistos Plethon's ideas surrounding this universal paganism, if you will. This, you know, one mind, one intelligence. I, I, I honestly, I think they had the idea of linking minds. I think the religion will be based on, it won't, it, there, there will be no, you know, set, standard, structured, liturgical hierarchy, if you will. There won't be any structures of worship or a deified force or metaphysical creator. The worship itself will be the state, much like Orwell, much like Orwell's 1984. The thing you shall venerate, worship, revere, the thing that will embody the state, the, I guess, the, the churches, the deities, if you will, the personifications of the state shall be, as Harari states, these new homo deus these godmen, these new Olympians. I think that's where this paganism comes into. This is this new theology. This is what this is. And then from there, they shall recreate everything because, well, they shall have total predictable control over mankind, or so they they think. So where does the Olympian thing come in? Is, is that, that the, the leaders of said states will... It's it's going to be like King Louis. They're going to kind of remodel themselves as as a god a god figure. So, oh no, they're they're going to they're going to become bio digitally enhanced. I, I, honestly, that's what they're they, they they seem to be stating within their works. Harari states that, like Schwab states that. Well, is is this not kind of vaguely reminiscent of this SS uh, Aryan godman type deal, where you know. Absolutely, yeah. Himmler discussed it as well. You know, they, they obviously had the, the Thule Society, the Thulians. They had this idea of, again, the Aryan master race. The Ubermensch as well was something that they seemed to... I mean, they distorted largely, but it was something that derived from you know, Nietzsche's ideas regarding that. Again, that's as old as time itself, this idea of the overman concept, where... Phys both physically and spiritually, where man is in an ascended state. What they wish to do, though, is uh, use that state for what all empires want, which is eternal preeminence, thousand-year Reich, <laughs> if you will, power to perpetuity. That's exactly what they wish. There was there was a mate of mine years ago when when the film The Matrix came out, and um, you know the bit where it says, "Do you want the, the red pill or the blue pill?" And uh, we used call we used call the guy John Drugs. <laughs> John would say, I, "I'll take them both." You know, I'll take them both. But it seems to me like that. You know, on an ordinary human level, like if you're in the nightclub at half two in the morning and someone turns around to you and said, "Silas, do you want to become a god?" Like on an almost ordinary level, you can kind of forgive the almost addict-like impulsive power hungry response you can kind of understand it it's not to say it's right but you can see how intoxicating that will be if if you know what i mean that there but well it seems that the, the cost is for us but not for them oh yeah definitely i mean well the cost for us is well potentially potentially I, I, it's a new world they're bringing in there was a new quote from harari he gave an interview very recently I, I tweeted about it. I think this may be... Just briefly, Her Harari, Harari is a scholar of... of is, 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 he, is he an Israeli scholar? Am I right in saying that? Academic? He is. He is. I'm not sure what field of study he's, he's actually in. I, I can imagine it's either sociology or philosophy or anthropology or... or... What, na what, where is, what nationality is the gentleman... Mr. Harari. Israel. Israeli. Okay, Israel. He's, he actually works as a professor in the same university that Gershom Sholem studied with him. Okay, all right, okay. And what's his quote? His quote, uh, so he recently gave an interview where he states, people or the vast majority are no longer part of the story of the future, Harari says. They simply have no role. Humanity 1.0 is being phased out and only those humans willing to make the transition to humanity 2.0 and join the all new species of transhumans will survive. He doesn't say it's survive, but that's pretty much what he's implying. So, uh, I, you couldn't make this up, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's it's insanity, but this is what these people are doing. Well, look at it on, on, on an ordinary sort of a day to day level where, you know, the likes of 
average Joes like myself are going in and out to work. Um, I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but there seems to be, um, perhaps this was always there. In fact, I know it was definitely there in my father's time in, in the workplace, for example, but that you're you're dealing with uh, a certain type of individual uh, that is, how would I say, homogenized, standardized, and has quite a certain outlook on things and is, seems to be quite happy, if not actively promoting uh, the new normal way of being and i don't i don't just mean that with with you know reference to the medical situation but generally speaking they seem to be quite institutionalized in their thinking and it seems to me that we're kind of encountering these individuals quite a bit more well i feel i am and um that like the point i'm trying to make is that if you're not in you can't win so, so says you, so what? Well, that might mean, for example, you're in your workplace trying to get ahead and do your thing. And if you don't fit the bill, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb and you you won't really work. And Or it might, it might have ramifications for your personal life if you're trying to find a significant other somewhere. If you don't tick the boxes as being successful in the new system, that uh, you might, you know, be deemed a failure by a lot of people. So, I, I mean, we've had this type of conversation before. What happens? What's in store for us, those of us who are outside the bell curve or who think we might be outside the bell curve? And it seems that uh, Mr. Harari might be right, you know, that the system itself will kind of devour us or cast us aside as uh, useless non-entities who haven't acquiesced to humanity version 2.0 and the cultural standardization that comes with it because Silas it seems to me that standardization unification normalization and the the Borg like evenness of the new humanity is a critical factor that we all should be streamlined and sanitized and pasteurized homogenized and uh you know move is that correct that's a very that seems to be a key point like uh, exactly what he's stating you know people will no longer be part of the story of the future well this sort of speaks to what we were discussing. This new theology, this new religion. How do you, how do you bring this in? This sort of reverence to the state, unwavering reverence to the state, and to the Olympians, the Homo Deus that will govern it. Well, the only way to do that, and uh, for people to have no sort of input within the political or cultural or social identity or destiny, rather, of the the nation and the world. The only way to bring that in, to facilitate that, is via basically huskifying society. Probably by biodigital means, sort of making them into, turning them into just automatons. When, when they discuss automation and the sort of full automation of society, they're not discussing that, you know, we will no longer work and it will be a utopia and we'll be living on universal basic income and eating grapes and, and, and wondrous exotic, exotic fruit from the robot butlers. It, that's not going to happen. What they mean by full automation is that we will be automated. We will become the new automatons. As you're saying, this human 2.0, they, they will be the perfect standardized model, even more so than we have now. I mean, which is a rather, rather steep stretch, I'd say, but nonetheless, that seems to be what they're persevering towards. Well, it, see, it seems to me that if, if you took any cross-section of human society, say we took a thousand human beings and put them on a desert island and left them there for a thousand years and came back to see how, how, how did they get on. Well, of that cross-section, it would seem that quite possible that per perhaps, say, five to seven percent of them would be intellectually inclined, they'd be artists, artistically inclined, They'd be capable of, of lateral thinking outside the box and they would understand concepts like freedom and, you know, the poetic sensibility, artistic sensibility, just the ability to look at things uh, in a certain way that's objective. However, the, the vast majority of people, perhaps up to, you know, up to 60 to 70 percent are, are like the worker bees in the hive, the drones, they are no less human than anyone else, but they have a certain sensibility, a different sensibility, shall we say. 
And I think that's just a normal, natural occurrence that there are different types of people and there's nothing wrong with that in any way, shape or form. But it seems to me that what has happened is the standardized, if you will, drone worker bee psychology has been apprehended and has been shifted along by, whereas traditionally it would be moved and guided perhaps by its own intellectual and our artistic cultural creators who would be that little bit still part of the group but a little bit outside the bell curve of their own group and who would be critical or looking at it uh, uh, objectively and trying to shift it along and would be responsible for creating the trends and the movements within that group and would eventually contribute to keeping the system as as a whole healthy and alive and self-preserving because it would question you know norms that have been accepted that weren't necessarily healthy for the group exactly whereas what seems to have happened now is that the innovator section of society has been dismantled and completely reimagined and has been replaced with this fake psychological warfare postmodernist been weaponized hasn't it completely yeah but and and but it's like a, a a whole clunk of us have been uh what's the medical term amputated from the group we've been surgically removed and we are now <laughs> useless we are commenting here on the, in some dusty corner of the internet trying to make sense of the whole thing but we have been replaced and mr swab has replaced us miss thunberg has replaced us and uh, these are the new, the new thinkers, the new guiders of right and wrong. <laughs> and uh, it, it just seems to be, well, I mean, Silas, if we stand back and be completely objective for a second, we have to say it is a, is a masterful act of psychological warfare, is it not? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. But I mean, really, what, once, they, once they achieved this capture of the means of credit, of literal infinite currency and, in essence, the ability to rig the market. Because they can, they have quite a, a degree of sway over the market via the, in essence, infinite liquidity. They, they can afford themselves certain sort of cheats, if you will. They, they, can, they can engage in beguilement quite a bit easier with, with infinite resources at their disposal. But yes, yes, it is quite masterful what they've done, what they've managed to do. But uh, as the man said, Silas, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time. So they are playing quite a dangerous game. Oh, oh yes. Oh, there's more, more and more people now. Because, well, well, this is the problem. With what they're attempting to do, so what we're going through right now is the transitionary phase. And unfortunately, it's not the end of the transitionary phase. We're simply going through the beginnings of it. They are setting the ground that's all they're doing right now, setting the ground for the next stages that will be far more radical and far more sudden in, in their scope of change, if you will, over not just society, but over the, I mean, the, the entirety of the system as a whole. So... And come here, just on that very briefly, Silas, would you concur that the medical event... The objective of the medical event from a psychological warfare point of view may have been a standardized reaction from the public. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. It is an, it is an experiment, of course, but it's the culmination of what they've managed to do in terms of this dialectical warfare they've waged, you know, via psychological means across the internet. They, they in essence, weaponized the internet. I think it was a weapon probably from the beginning. But they managed to basically bring people, corral people in to this new style of thinking, which was culminated in the, the sort of symbolic act, if you will, symbolic ritual of going and becoming needle-crafted. Also, as Harari states, we don't need the vast majority of people now. What he means by that is the sort of biodigital system they wish to create, obviously it will be entirely perpetuated by computer systems and algorithms. It'll be an algocracy, a rule by algorithm. I, and obviously that links with cybernetics and, <laughs> in essence, uh, control theory as well. Would that tie in, like, if you remove, 
if you remove the intellectual artistic aspect the traditional natural aspect of it from society and you bring in your um nodes of control yeah it it, it just it follows in what you're saying that all you need after a certain point in time once you've co-opted the the, the, psycho- the psychological consciousness of society is an algorithm and you just need to throw the mirrors and smoke and and you've you've you sort of cut the umbilical cord in a sense the nat- the natural connection to but in, in a way uh, silas is is this not are we not talking about insanity in the true dictionary definition of the word or psychosis that it's a sort of uh, a drift a psychological like because what i mean is for example the term sanity what is sanity like where how do i know who I am, where I am, that I'm okay, that who can I trust and love, uh, you know, th- the basic things that keep me sane are about the, you know, an element of who I am is is discerned by virtue of my relationship to the world around me, is it not? Oh yes, absolutely. Sanity is validated by one's surroundings. But the problem is, when we say we live in an insane world, what, what we're saying is, there is degrees or levels, sort of limit, liminality towards that validation. So, though we may not be validated, in truth, we are ostracized by this society at large. Therefore, we may feel like we are insane. But the society that ostracizes us, the, the, you know, the ones that we would call insane, juxtaposed to, to nature, it is entirely inimical. To, to the interests of nature and to the structure of nature. So therefore, that is the higher degree of validation of one's sanity. Is it in keeping with nature or is it not? Well, obviously, this society is absolutely not in keeping with nature. We're, we're seeing it as we speak. I think even 10 or 20 years ago, I think it was more so, and we had more stability there. I just have to quickly, quickly interject there. There's a super irony, weird twist in the tale here. Like, if you can alter nature even the perception of what nature is then you can you can keep the you can keep the psychosis alive in a perfect stasis like a perfect system because you quit your haldron collider and you mix it with your um you know globalist uh, hype through the media of whatever, you know, calamitous events that are happening. And, you know, I mean, the sky's the limit, right? In a sense. That's it. That's it. Exactly. What was that? That is the culmination of control theory or cybernetics. Autopoiesis, a, a self-regulating system, a closed loop system that just constantly, constantly goes around and there's no, there's no breakage in the information transfer. And is that, Oh, yes, this type scenario. Is that where you see the thing heading? Oh, no, that's exactly where it's going. That's exactly what Harari's discussing. Totally links in. So are we, are we agreeing with Harari here, for clarity? That this is where the future is going? Yes, yes. Or that's where they wish to take us. But he, he's celebrating it, whereas, whereas we're, uh, you know... Oh, we're, we're loathing it, yeah. <laughs> we don't like the idea. Exactly. Obviously, we, we're the target. <laughs> but we do, we're, not, we're not taking away... The man is right. We think he's right. I would say he's right in terms of where the cabal wish to take us and him being a salesman of this idea, this radical notion for the reformation of society and of the species as a whole. Because, again, like most of these, as we saw with the beginning of, uh, pardon me, as we saw with the beginning of the Renaissance and the Renaissance humanists, primarily out of a uh, I think the, the name of the, the town or city is Epistoia in Tuscany uh, and in Florence as well, or Firenze, that area of northern Italy. It was mainly birthed out of there. But as we saw, these intellectuals like Amistos, Plethon, Leonardo, Bruni, other, other ones, anyway, they were all backed. All these intellectuals, the only way to engage in intellectualism, in, in, in essence, is, to, is for someone to fund you if you're going to do it full time. Because it doesn't, it, honestly, it doesn't pay the bills, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, 
society really doesn't have a need for it in, in any value-oriented sense, bar special interests that can use it in some sort of manipulative way. So obviously, as we saw Cosimo de' Medici, a, 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 an Italian financier and political bourgeois character, financed all of this. He was the beginnings of the financing of this, the, the transmigration of the occult body of work into Western Europe as a whole, and that spread throughout the Renaissance. And obviously you had the Northern Renaissance, which was later on as well, places like Amsterdam, uh, even London, and a lot of the European nobility that still hold positions to this day. A lot of the dynasties were born out of this Northern Renaissance. One of the most prominent would be the von der Leyen's, which we see today. Ursula von der Leyen, who married in to this wealthy dynasty. Her family, of which she is now adopted into by virtue of her marriage to a member of said family, that family were silk merchants. However, I really do suspect they were probably taken into this cult, this cabal, during the Northern Renaissance, when this type of mystical knowledge, this cultish-like religion that we see, that we have many names for it, Kabbalah, occultism, masonry, even Gnosticism, humanism as well, that spread to Belgium, Holland, which is where the von der Leyen family are from, Northern Germany, near the border of Belgium and Holland and what have you. So yes, absolutely. Also as well, we see the tri-state city, which is probably why they're buying up a load of farmland in, in the Netherlands, and they're speeding up the acquisition of said farmland. Obviously this is being done by primarily the World Economic Forum through various front organisations, which the World Economic Forum itself is a front organisation. But yes, they wish to create a super city. This is probably going to be the northern capital of this Novus Ordo Soclorum, this new world order, this new humanist religious centre of pure unadulterated control. Funnily enough, it's built in a semi-circular manner. It's huge, it covers, it's, it's huge, this city. In essence, it, it's a megalopolis in the truest sense. It covers pretty much most of Belgium and Holland, and it covers quite a great, a great degree of northeast France and northwest Germany. So that's the scope is of the city. So a humanist capital, in essence, a satanic capital, but a satanic New World Order. We have the same southern satanic capital found within Neom. Neom itself is found in the Hebrew Genesis 22.16, which... It roughly is pronounced as Nehom or in Nehom, which literally means to say or to declare or a prophet or oracle in, in a sort of noun sense. Similarly, the Vatican has an extremely similar etymological meaning. If you look at the word Vatican, it actually comes from a composite of two Latin words, Vates, which means soothsayer, and kinor, or sinor, in ecclesiastical Latin, which means to sing. So it comes from vaticinor, or vaticanor, which literally means the singing soothsayer, in essence a false prophet. Digressing, in terms of the Northern Renaissance, that would encompass a lot of what John Dee would, would end up doing in his work. So all t I mean, this whole thing ties in. It's a tapestry, conspiracy. Well, just brief, briefly, briefly on D and Co and on the Renaissance characters and the occult, can we, in the in the most simplest sense, can we say that we're we're talking about individuals that are manipulating, attempting to manipulate nature to their own end, to play God, as it were, to commune with spirits or devils or angels or whatever it may be, and um, that essentially they're, we might say, they're an offence to to the divine, if we if we believe in the divine sense of creation. In that they're they're playing God, right? So as you say, it's part of the tapestry. Do you see, is that how you see them kind of tying in from the occult side of things? That they're they, they, the mentality. I mean, the guiding mentality under it all is 
I'm not happy with this setup. I want to, you know, I want that girl or I want to be rich or, you know, I want dead, and I'm going to go through a crystal ball or a demon or I'm going to sacrifice a goat or uh, some people or whatever, whatever it is to, to appease my God to get that to happen. So is that kind of the, the underlying mentality? Is there, they're that venal and that, uh, you know, driven by their most base instincts, instincts that they, they go to that kind of level, that they're prepared to go there. And not only prepared to go there, it's like they're thirsty for that kind of way of... Oh, well, absolutely, yeah. Well, it's all about knowledge. That's what it is all about. I mean, even social media, the internet, everything we're discussing here, it's, it's based around information. That's it. Knowledge is power, it's key. The one with the knowledge is, is the one that controls society. Knowledge is far, far more advantageous to power than a, a, a million or a <laughs> hundred million swords will ever be. Knowledge can cut deeper than any sword could ever. I mean, this, this is the sort of irony of the entire world. But that being that, you know, it is the spiritual elements, the mental elements that are of higher importance than just the physical. Again, this ties into, for example, if you're going to annex a, a, you know, a city, you can't just send in troops and you know, waste the city. Because, again, what's the point of conquering it? You've just destroyed the productivity of said city. The way to do it is by this idea of hearts and minds. You have to persuade people via information and via a sort of mimetic spin on information. You know, a propaganda, that's what we call it. But what, what they're attempting to do, the reason they don't need the majority of people, I'm sorry, I may, I may be going on a tangent here, is, is because with the computer systems that they have now and will have in the future, I mean, if we just look at it on a linear trajectory, the, the processing and memory capacity, processing capabilities, pardon, are not there to deal with essentially the exponential rise from the population levels we have now, where they will go in basically the future. They're going to, obviously, as, as we know, they're, they'll go into the, the tens, hundreds of billions, probably. That's the way population growth, in essence, works. They can slow it down, but it's, it's, it's large, largely, it's all, it's all based around, they have to get rid of the, the, the chains of reproduction, the sort of nodes of reproduction itself. But is your view that the, the, the one of the main reasons for the reduction, proposed reduction or mooted reduction of population numbers is to basically have a more con a more controllable um, society? Is because then the computer, as you were kind of intimating there, the computer processing power uh, will be able to handle less people. Is that what you're saying? It'll, it'll be far more accurate. All the algorith all algorithms are far more, far more accurate. If you take, especially with compl, we're, I mean, even even with the predictable human that they're wishing to create, even that would be still quite a complex creature. So, so to make it even far more predictable, far more foolproof, if you will, they, they require a smaller sample to begin with, because obviously population is exponential; it, it grows exponentially. So therefore, they have to begin with a smaller sample to give themselves as much, much of a chance as possible to innovate in terms of processing capacity and memory capacity. And obviously the materials required to create said computer systems which maintain the, these algorithms and process the information from society itself. But if, if, we're, if what we're talking about here is correct, right? Um. Have the, have the power structure as it is already not got like such tremendous power that they wouldn't even really like what is their motive to, to get even to the point you're talking about, which by which I mean um, drastically re reducing population numbers with a, with a view to marrying, you know, technology into the control of, of society, etc. Like how much more do you need if you're already at the top? You know what I mean? What I'm trying to get at is what is the ma the motive? Do you think to to get where where you're saying where you believe this thing is is headed? What's the main motivation? I I would honestly say they have all the they have all the power, they have the power as is as is. But it's it's all yeah. about maintaining it into perpetuity, because with any sort of system as we know, 
because the universe is, in essence, a waveform. It's, it's entirely frequency-based, everything we see. All of the mediums, photons, all of, all of these mediums, all of these energetic expressions as well, are all wave-based. So therefore, the sine wave, you will always have a rise and a fall. What they want, again, as we were saying, autopoiesis, that, that needs to be scrapped. Again, as you're saying, they need to cut the umbilical cord from nature entirely. They need to, in, in essence, recreate this system so it's, it's pure, it's bi it's, in essence, it's binary, it's digital. That's why they love digitalism so much, as opposed to an uh, analog. And they talk about digitalism. Absolutely, yes. yes. So they're, they're looking for absolute assurance. No entropy, that's and it. No, no entropy, to use your term. So a complete system that runs smoothly, perfectly, that's highly engineered, that has no loss, that is a system of absolute input, process, output. It's totally predictable, and it runs like the engine in a Porsche. It's just like a work of art, of engineering art, in a sense. It's a, something to behold. Absolute gardening. Uh, they're gardeners. Like I've I've heard the the national the Nazis before to refer to as a gardening state, and it was it was kind of a, a term. It it was a way of understanding their outlook on race, race racism. They were obviously racists in the truest sense of the word, but they were a gardening state in the, in that they were trying to remove anything that they felt didn't belong. So this is the absolute zenith of the gardening globalist state that you will now have a society that's completely and utterly runs like a computer circuit board. I'll, I'll, I'll send you something. This is from Stafford Beer. Now, a very sort of unknown, but very influential thinker within cybernetics. Now, obviously, this individual is he's, he's a, Lenin, a Marxist, Leninist, and, and what have you. But he developed this... He was called over by the Marxist or socialist government of, I think it was Chile. Yes, it was. Ale Allende's Chile. And Allende was looking to put into practice the Marxist-Leninist econom economic system and social system and to have it run into perpetuity and base it, in essence, like a scientific dictatorship. Though, or it was scientifically or algorithmically controlled, if you will. A planned economy. So I'll send you this. This is called Project Cyber Sin. This is basically the beginnings of what I'm terming here. This is way ahead of its time. The, the computer systems weren't even really there to institute this type of system. But this is what they were wanting to go for. It's basically what you're seeing here. What it was meant to be. Let's just imagine that the computer systems could create what Stafford Beer envisioned. In essence, you would have this control room, and uh, with this control room, in these seven individuals, you would have them controlling the entirety of the system at hand, based on the the input, the big data, computer systems, and the information that was coming into them to control it via from a control room, if you will, entirely planned economy from one room. Eventually, Stafford Beer, because this was scrapped, Allende was assassinated. Well shot remorselessly by another revolutionary group. But Stafford Beer developed this furthermore and theoretically, and he started to understand that you don't actually need the human element to control society. You could actually control it via algorithms. In, fa in fact, having the human element and with the complexity of emotions and, you know, other such compounding factors if inherent within the human condition would only slow down or it impede the, the algorithm, the control via the algorithm. So from that was developed this idea of algocracy, you know, rule by algorithm. And the, the algorithm input, as it were, as a control input for the system, i.e. the controlled society, are the input nodes such things as media, I'm guessing, education system, uh, you know, and are, uh, what are the inputs? As you understand it, as I as I saw an illustration by, I'll see if I can find it because Stafford Beer created an illustration of this. But Beer's Beer's concept is for social control. Is that correct? Or control of of a 
so social and economic control. So basically control of the society is, yes, so he cre th this is sort of different, but if you can, you can sort of get this idea of what he's... This isn't it, but it was similar to this. The modes would be, or, or the, the nodes of control, with that which they wanted to control, that which they were controlling, and the subcategories of media, economics, or what have you, it would all be set up like this. It'd be set up on in terms of interrelationships. So the algorithm would be set up in this way, and it would affect and regulate the control functions of society. So media, emotional controls, primarily disseminated by the media, fear, apprehensiveness, even advertisement plays upon our deep-seated insecurities, anything like that, that, those are all control functions. The top, the pinnacle of direct control functions are obviously the enforcer class or the military wing of the government, that is, the police and military. The police themselves are a standing army, they are merely the subordinate form of the military control function. Authority, and the perception of authority, is itself a control function. Anything that controls the behavioural patterns of the human, and thus regulates the society at large, anything that stops entropy, is a control function. Entropy can be described as, if one thinks of a formation of atoms, tight-knit and cohesive, and as the universal law seems to hold, then after some time, the cohesion of this formation begins to break down, or is affected by entropic pressures. These pressures are inbuilt into the very architecture, mathematical and otherwise, of the universe as a whole. Creation does not exist within a vacuum, and must have the force of destruction, to thus provide for it the stable conditions for its existence, the equilibrium, so to say. And likewise, we can see the extent of this natural axiom within the force of destruction, and its requisite mutually complementary component of creation. Thus, what they seek is to digitise life, and ensure it becomes controllable binary pulsations, to which, as Harari states, they can then harness the power of creation and destruction. You see, this is what they are fighting against, the loss of their powerful position through the natural tendency towards the entropic effect. To further elucidate upon that point, if entropy takes hold, then the cohesion within the formation of atoms breaks down. Thus, if the cohesion breaks down, then the links within the chain of information, this gets into the tenets of Harari's notions on dataism, that is, the freedom of information, or free flow of information is paramount, and for any atom to impede it, if the atom cannot be altered, then it must be destroyed, according to Harari, by Gresson. If information cannot pass down the chain of command of the society and hierarchy, then the control function begins to wane in its effectiveness of the behavioural patterns of the human. Therefore, control functions are merely like a regulator or modulator that are inserted within the circuitry or circuit board of society to facilitate homeostasis or the regulation of the perceived imbalances within the equilibrium to then deny entropy any room to grow and multiply to sterilise the energy flow within the human, create a husk without agency, except for the minimal agency provided to it by the algocratic motherboard. This is why we see the genetic modification of the human occurring right now, through a variety of imaginative means, that is, through primarily graphene-based nano-platforms, we will see the gradual biodigital and genetic assimilation of the human into a more conducive form, ready to be received into the cold and icy embraces, of the future digital infrastructure. Its frequency is the basis of this universe and world, so shall it be the basis of the world to come, and psychotronics, so long dreamed of within the minds of maverick devils, will become a reality within the new anti-human paradigm shift and algorithm. The rows of beacons we saw going up whilst we were resigned to house arrest, the minarets and spires of the new theological system of control, have set aflame the idea of going back, intact, to the pre-reset days. All we must do now is adapt our own selves to this and prepare to resist it with every fibre of our being. For example, too, we see the same reductive notion of society being akin to this electric circuitry within silent weapons for quiet wars. If indeed it was a hoax, this report, then it was a rather coincidentally predictive one as it connects quite thoroughly with the cybernetic vision and now 
transhumanist and stakeholder capitalist vision of the future. This is why the would-be controllers, the human farmers, find it far more prudent to reduce society and humanity to a digitised system to then expedite the process of computerising and automating the society and species. Analogue systems akin to nature require vastly more complex mathematical processes to predict the wildly volatile oscillations of the curve as opposed to the straight etched lines of the digital pathway. Although digitally based systems, though less complex, tend to have far less room dealing with complexity than their analogue counterparts. And thus, to mitigate this inherent flaw within digital systems, one is best to render and reduce everything within the system to a state of digital compatibility. From that, enter the transitionary period we see now, and the aforementioned developments we are seeing take place, the ones that I have just described, digressing, however as well with Stafford Beer. Obviously he was way ahead of, it, of his time. What they're talking about now is using deep learning AI. This is where AI comes into it. AI is, this idea that AI will be sent in and what have you not is, that's, again, that's a distraction. The AI will never go out with its parameters. What the, AI, the, the real danger of AI is putting into practice what Beer was stating. That you create literally a control room, in essence, where the algorithm actually can in, in real time run the computational processes, basically working out all of the interrelationships between, say, if it was in the economy and, and all of these, the industry, the, the supply chain, the logistics, food and water, the just-in-time and inventory systems, it could work out all of those interrelationships and develop a solution for it, and then take that solution and, in essence, smooth out the oscillations that would occur within any, say, market, they could, in essence, create a planned economy. They could perfect the, the imperfect system of Marxist-Leninism. Obviously, that's not the system that they're going for. It's it, it, There is a racial element to it as well, as we're seeing. They wish to create a, you know, a, a homogenous race, a sort of a grey man, if you will, you know, a, a diverse race, if you will, which isn't actually diverse, it's, it's, it's very homogenous. It's sort of everyone in a bag shake up and then homogenise all of their culture, their ethnicity and, and their social customs and what have you. Even their language. There will be one language as well. That's another system, uh, thing they want. It's, it is very cold and calculating, the, the sort of system they envision. I'm, just, I'm, I'm having a quick uh, bluffer's guide to Mr. Stafford Beer here on uh, Wikipedia. and He's a very interesting character, someone I hadn't actually heard about before. Um, he... Yeah, the, the, the uh, project you're talking about is Project CyberSyn. And I believe, and uh, during the administration of the South, uh, in Chile in the early 1970s, Beer was closely involved with a visionary project CyberSyn to apply his cybernetic theories to government. The project's ultimate goal was to create a network of computers and communications equipment that would support the management of the state-run sector of Chile's economy. At its core would be an operations room where government managers could view important information about economic processes in real time, formulate plans of action and transmit advice and directives to managers at plants and enterprises in the field. So that all, that all sounds wonderful, especially if you're in management. And just very briefly as well, another observation on his, uh, just his Wikipedia page here. Uh, he beer ran a residential course at the Falcondale Hotel in Lampeter in the UK. I believe nine lessons were recorded. And just of note, the sessions covered art, science and philosophy, as well as the practical application of cybernetics in society, government, community, management and business. And also it appears from his literature, published literature that he wrote a book of poems. So it's Which is interesting because a lot of these characters are probably polymaths, but they're, they're probably, um, they're kind of artists as well, and poets. You know, they're quite sens sensitive types. And at the same time, you know, uh, psyches that are sort of bottomless. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're unbelievable characters. But that's very interesting. You still there, Silas? Yeah, I was just going to mention on that just a really quick point. So I'm posting a, a few things in in the chat right now. I'll put them in the video, but 
there was a book that he, he brought out some time ago. I say some time, it's, it's like the 70s. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, Stafford Bear, he, he died in 2002, 75 years of age. Yes, he, he was actually he was a source of contemporary of a lot of the British cyberneticists that worked on, well, they learned off, I forget their name now, yeah, their names now, but they, they in essence, uh, were all students, if you will, of Norbert Wiener and von, von Neumann, who developed the book Game Theory, which is, in essence, probability. And obviously probability is, is, is very much tied up with this idea of social control and algorithms. But that you just look at this, this is another sort of way of what I was just discussing there, the interrelationships between all of these various nodes and synthesizing them down into, in essence, a, a, a system of a closed loop, a negative feedback loop system. So Stafford Beer actually used this, the right hand geometric shape, he used that quite frequently. That shape <laughs> is actually used by masonry quite, quite a lot. And it's used to... Aha! I know, yeah, aha! <laughs> it's used to showcase the, the sort of unification of creation and the creator. And it's also, it also shows the divine feminine and masculine aspects. The merging or unifying, the synthesizing, if you will, of the thesis and antithesis. The order out chaos. I bet he's an... In he's an in Mr. Beer is an interesting dude, I bet. Oh, definitely, definitely. Also, as well, on, on as you see the brain of the firm, we have again the zodiac with ten lines, uh, uh, or the ten areas or zones protruding out, which again sort of links with the Simpson of Kabbalah and also zodiacal, mid seasonal and equinox and solstice points. So it's it's all the it's the occult it is it's the they basically took the occult and put it into scientific, digital and algorithmic models, if you will. I, I, that's what it looks to me. Maybe, maybe I'm looking too much into it, but no, I think I think you're I think you're onto something because we've come across so many of these characters that are brilliant minds in the area they work in, but then you find out that they're an artist of some description, and it kind of doesn't. It sort of clashes a little bit with your stereotypical view of them, and then you do a little bit more research, and it seems that they. Sometimes and uh, seem to have connections in the occult, or are connected to perhaps societies of one description or, or another. But it all ties back into the origins of science, which which were was alchemy, and you know this this idea that you're looking into the fabric of things, and you're trying to analyze and understand things, and you're applying method, <clears throat> and somewhere on your journey you stumble down a different path and you discover things and perhaps you discover other people who have also discovered things and that just opens a whole other world for you and at that point then i mean what does one do what do you do silas if i if i showed you something and if i illuminated you in the path and uh you know I, you were, you know, showing things which startled you and amazed you and you became aware of things that you thought were never possible in this world. Wouldn't you feel special for having witnessed those things? Wouldn't you feel amazed and enthralled? And it w would it be very difficult, would it not, for you to reconcile with your old life prior to this awakening, this illumination? So this mystical adventure, that this door that had opened in front of you? how tempting it would be to walk through to be surrounded by your your brothers or sisters who were initiates and you know how the world of knowledge was to be open to you infinite as above and below and it would be deeply intoxicating and i think for the average person it would be extremely hard to resist because it could be easily presented to you in such a way as showing that it would solve various problems, it would resolve various crises, it would provide solutions, it was a new way of thinking, it was magical in the truest sense of the word. So if such a world exists, perhaps for a silent few in the world, um, I wish them all the best. 
but um, I'm not sure it's for me because I think other my my regular life because I I, I think that uh, it would be such a poison chalice in a way, and um, that kind of power ultimately must corrupt as we're we're humans ultimately, and you know. So I think it, but in, in, but I can see the excitement of it, uh, that almost childlike um, sense of wonder and curiosity, and you know. But it's like somebody doing a drug for the first time. You know, it's like just take heroin once. It's really cool. <laughs> you know, it's it's you know but I, I i see the folly of it too you know there's a folly in there somewhere and I, 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 one is blinded by one's own hubris really and naivety and grandiose sense of ego and all, all these things come into play but but to go back to the the actual point to and this is no to cast no aspersion on mr Stafford beer maybe he was an absolutely genial person and we we're being very very unkind Oh, oh no! Oh, he's, he, I, I've seen some interviews of him, and I, I actually have to admit I feel sorry for him because at the end of his life, he sort of was many of his theories, and t if you were to put them into you know business in terms of running a business and management theory, it, it works extremely well. It's, it's <laughs> the pro the problem is when it's you know applied uh, to, to you know in, in another sense for social control. But yeah, I, I sort of felt sorry for him with, within a few few interviews uh, that he gave in classes and lectures because people didn't really seem to listen to him. You know, the, the sort of, not the intellectuals, the sort of run-of-the-mill, you know, middle management types. He was doing sort of classes for them and they, some of them were recorded. But, you know, th those people are just total yes-men there. <laughs> Most of them are idiots, unfortunately. But yes, I, yeah, he, he did. He, he, I think he was honestly just attempting to create. He has this idea called the viable system model. I think honestly, he was just attempting to create a sort of predictable system. And I think it's put to them as, well, if you do this, you will create world peace. Because if there's no com competition within, you know, inter societally and inter globally, then there is no, there's, there's no need for war. So, well, it's a sacrifice, you know. We need to make. We need to get rid of human freedom. The human ability to to reason and to to have free will unhindered by external uh, an external force, we need to get rid of that to to engender a system of world peace. That that's another thing that they've pushed, and another societal narrative that they have pushed. You know, who can be against world peace? Well, how how do you, how do you uh, determine peace? Well, the only way to to maintain world peace and to maintain it for any long period of time. Is to destroy all competition. I mean, it's sort of the is the irony of you know peace, but uh, yeah, uh, pe peace is but a neutral state of war. One could say. I, d I don't mean I don't mean to wish to be cynical. Well, I think I, I think isn't isn't it fair to most things in the in the universe exist in opposites. So it's like every day of peace we had was was fought for at some point in time by somebody. You know, it may, it may again in time that we have to fight for our peace, you know. <laughs> but just very briefly, Mr. Anthony Stafford Beer, just to, he, at 17 years of age, he enrolls, enrolls for a degree in philosophy at University College London. So imagine at 17 you're going studying philosophy and de degree. But in 1994, you join the Royal Artillery and you're a gunner then with the Royal Fusiliers and the 9th Gorkha Rifles, and you see service in India. So you're a soldier until 1947. You change your name. He dropped the use of his first name, Anthony, when he was 21, and persuaded his brother to sign a statement that he would not, not use the name Stafford. Strange, but he did, which he did. Then he joins the United Steel in 1956. Uh, this is a British corporation. Uh, it was a steel-making, engineering, coal mining, and coal byproduct group based in uh, Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. So he joins a co his first, uh, this big corporation, and he persuades management to fund an operational research group, the Department of Operations Research and Cybernetics, which he headed. 
and this was based in Cyber House and they installed a Ferranti Pegasus computer, the first in the world dedicated to management cybernetics. So that's no that's no um <laughs> mediocre C V. You know, it, you, this 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 guy is some dude, you know. But if you're right, and I suspect you might be right, he maybe he was one of the forerunners to what we're looking at here. You know? Maybe he was one of the the cyber sense seems kind of model seems to be a prototype on, on a smaller scale for mass management using computers. And if 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 you kinda of, as you kinda of intimated there, you kinda of felt a bit sorry for the dude in, in one sense that maybe he's you know, he's a gifted mind perhaps, and he finds himself unwittingly designing and brainchilding this system <laughs> which you know, he's he sees his baby, his creation is now being thwarted and abducted and twisted and into some sort of malevolent, you know, machinery for, for globalist control. <laughs> so he started off and perhaps he was uh, well-meaning, you know, but maybe the thing is just, you know, he, he birthed a monster as it were. Oh, that's, yeah, most most innovators are, or, or most innovators do sort of birth monsters unfortunately and it's not it's it's not a monster from birth it's merely the potential the potential for you know monstrosity from birth everything gets militarized weaponized and uh, as we were mentioning you know any military its main objective first and foremost is not to deter or to to busily plan against foreign enemies, it's, it's to plan against and deter domestic enemies. What we mean by domestic enemies, we mean challengers or challengers to the state, dissidents. And so yes, it's, that's exactly what it gets used for. They, they, use it, they use it now, I mean the, the nudge units as well. Within, for example, the, the British system. I'm sure Ireland has, uh, the Republic of Ireland has a similar system. The US, Canada, any, any nation. Any intelligence agency or apparatus w will use probably some some level of control theory or management theory to thus engender social control within the society at large. And they, that will be based around algorithms. Obviously, we have as well social media. We haven't really touched upon that, but you know, briefly, that is the the sort of informational harvesting points. So that's what social media is. It's to harvest information and also iPhones as well, it's to harvest information, firstly, to see what people are doing, where they are, their trends, in terms of their thinking, and secondly, to see if the, the, the narratives they are disseminating, nudging amongst the public, are taking effect. As, as you were saying, the, the garden society. This is sort of like human and cattle farming, it's, it's like agrarian systematization taken to its culmination. <laughs> And, and and you use you use the data the data to inform your algorithm all the time. So it has constantly in real time evolving, as it were. It's learning the behavioural trends and patterns. But it, in, it, innovation is a thing in 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 the human psyche, is it not? Like so, every once in a while, somebody does something that's completely left of field and innovative and trend setting and mold breaking, etc. So, like. Is that still a thing? And, uh, you know, is there still room for human innovation and to throw a spanner in the works? Or, like, my, 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 my real question is, what is it, that term again that you used for when the system is self-sustaining? Alpo, altro, altro. Yeah, so you said, in your view, that's a given, that that's going to happen. But in a separate conversation with you, I remember you telling me that nothing can rise higher than its source. So if if you have the system that is self-sustaining, um, Mother Nature it it's, it exists as as we said, like you know, it has cut the umbilical cord to, to Mother Nature, and it is its own world within a world. But the, my question is: Can Mother Nature still knock on the door, or can the participants within that world of Altropoesis. Uh, can they sort of deep down feel that something's wrong, and can there be entropy within that system? Still, in other words, is absolute predictability achievable? 
is 100% uh, insulation from entropy possible, do you think? There's always going to be a little, what the fuck's going on here moment for the people who are in that system deep down? Or is there always a, a rebellion or a breakdown? For, for the majority, if they inge- brought into to being this sort of algocracy, people would have, in essence, biodigital implants. They would be controlled via some form of psychotronic feedback, meaning frequency, fre- a frequency-based feedback of some some kind. I, I can imagine it would be some sort of wireless control. I know that sounds absolutely insane to most people, but the, the technology is there, it's, it's being developed. We, w- we will need the tinfoil hat, after all. <laughs> yeah, so... If, if they do that before. but no but seriously you, you, your your view on this is like is pretty like i mean you know it it's technological in the sense real hard technology in that there will be technology deployed for for control for population control oh it probably already is i i, I know that i know britain at least the, there was well it's not totally declassified it, it, it was rumors let's call them rumours, that they were installing on cell towers within the early noughties, in essence, frequency-based emitters, to see the effects of it upon the neurology individuals. I think the, the main ones were within Manchester. It was on Vodafone cell towers. Obviously, Vodafone has a, ra- a rather uh, <laughs> devilish logo, <laughs> shall we say. But that's just a, an aside note. Yes, it, for the majority, yeah, there, there will be no... It will be total predictability, because they will control you this new religion will be instituted and enforced via, again, this sort of autopoiesis via frequency-based technology, biodigital implants of some kind. I know that sounds fantastical, but they are developing technology. Well, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, it is and it isn't. In the one sense, it really is like it has the the sound of, the, you know, the stereotypical uh, schizophrenic um, symptoms, you know, um, I'm Napoleon Bonaparte, and I'm I'm getting signals through the radio. They've been you know, they've been sent into my mind, and I'm getting messages. But in a weird way, who knows? You know, maybe maybe the schizophrenics of old were actually, you know, sh- the shamans trying to tell us what was going down. You know what I mean? In a weird way, you know. I mean, all bets are off. I think Silas, in a sense, because the technology is advancing exponentially and that's just what we're what, what we understand i mean we don't really know what's at the cutting edge of stuff or where the the, the planning is or the thinking is um you know and, and we can imagine great minds uh like mr beer and co you know who are who are at the cutting edge of this who are and they're they're not just intellectuals but they're artists as well, you know. They have an artistic sensibility in in a, in a sense, or a poetic sensibility. That's in an, in a state of essence. In that it's not neither good nor bad, but it is in a, in a state of essence. So they have that kind of ingenuity of imagination, and of inspiration. In a moment, and it can be something profoundly human. And it's an innovative uh, point, but but it can be thwarted and twisted. That's our worry here, I think, that it, this innovation has been and is twisted and thwarted toward this uh, ambition that we're talking about. Oh, yeah, this, this Machiavellian yeah. uh, ambition. But I don't think, it, like, if we were on the inside, Silas, we would not consider ourselves, ourselves uh, to be Machiavellian. I think we will be considering ourselves to save. We're saving humanity from war, from famine, from strife, from the the humdrum plod of uh, mediocrity. Oh yeah, it's. I, I would absolutely agree with that. In the intellectual class, that are in essence pushing. Well, they're innovating for this agenda. They justify it within their minds. The, the defense, the loyalty. To this agenda because of these, in essence, ethical concerns that they probably have, though have most likely been implanted within their mind via some sort of indoctrination. Uh, you know, world peace. We, we will achieve world peace. But but who, who controls the world peace? Who regulates the world peace? 
Yes. They don't ask themselves that. But they, maybe they do. Maybe they, they are happy. You know, they, they feel, well, the elect, these individuals that are backing me are the elect. But I, I think as well, there is a system of autopoiesis throughout the majority of society. And it doesn't really control the mind so much as it, it, control, it controls the impulses within the biological system. So we already have that, uh, for example, a, a company called Vaxis. They're creating the nano patch within their, again, funded by Bill Gates. Neuralink, the Tesla Neuralink is very similar to this. It's within the patents, it discusses this nano patch can introduce biological stimuli and it can detect real time biological data and then pass it on, omit it to, to, to what we, we can only speculate. But it's within the patents. So it seems the systems are already in place right now. But obviously they just need the right crisis. But quick point, I'm, I'm, I'm going on tangents here, I do apologise. But the, the final point on this, eventually, because in essence the, the apex of the hierarchy do not, they still have intact their free will. And I mean, at that point, they will be enhanced via technology as they see themselves as Harari states. They're going to, I mean, their hubris will be off the scale. They will be absolutely enthralled with vanity and a, a, a pure love for self, right? And pleasure. They want more. They, they want, you know, they will want total power. Eventually, it's, it's going to be like the children of Saturn. They will eat each other, in essence, like the Ouroboros. That will probably create the quote-quote Great Reset, ironically. I, I think it is going to end in, in these ambitious cliques fighting each other for, you know, total power. But I, I do think their, their system is going to come in in, in some way or manner. But I don't think it's going to last for very long. That's pers just personally my, my opinion. But it's going to irrevocably shape the human species from this point onwards. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a given at this point, but there, it, I, there is more and more people resisting it, I, w I will say that. If what, you're, if what you're saying is correct, and if, um, you know, w would you estimate a time scale? Are we talking about a thousand years, two thousand years, five hundred years? Would you estimate? Oh, for the, for the, the longevity of the system for it is coming established up. for us to get into the, the nitty gritty of the hubristic, tyrannical control matrix. I'd say no more than honestly. I would say no more than three generations. If if the the elite, the quote quote elite of this you know common society, if they still remain entirely human in in their exercising of their free will, so by typically three generations. Because remember, see if they're still exercising their free will. There's still that umbilical cord. They still possess that umbilical cord to nature. They're still. But as you intimate there, like they're they're hub if hubris unimagined, hubris unbridled, like hubris on a cocaine binge, is complete. Is 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 humanity sort of unhinged from like severed from nature? Because what is hubris like? It's it's the extremist manifestation of selfhood without boundary so it's satanic in its nature if you want to use the kind of christian term but it's it has shunned god and the, the divine because one becomes god it's a true left-hand path initiative like so at some point you know we are to be we the population we the are to be liberated from freedom we're to be liberated from nature and we're to be liberated from god as it were because they are the things which cause the problems you know and it's it's such a weird inversion of nature and normality and the divine and humanity it's it's such a weird bastardized perverted inverted twisting of things that it's it's a distortion as you say it is a distortion and it is an artistic outlook and it's a postmodernist distortion of as somebody said one time you know art should venerate nature you know great art should venerate nature in some way but this is a, this is um this besmirches nature it 
it's horrific. But they've seen beauty in that horror somewhere. They've completely, it's, it's psychotic. It is a sheer form of madness. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Absolutely. And, and this is the problem. I mean, you're absolutely correct. We even see it within the art they promote. The art they seem to enjoy. Well, look at Podesta. Look at the art he was buying. The guy's an absolute psycho. He's a psycho wearing a suit. <laughs> That's pretty much the government we have running the, the show right now. Uh, psychos in suits. That, that sounds like a good name for a film, actually, or a documentary. But yes, the, the art that they promote is, is an absolute perversion of nature in the, in the most perfidious sense of, of that. In, in truth, the reason they love perverted art is because that's what they're doing themselves, as, as you're saying. They don't wish to just venerate nature within their governmental structures, their political and psychosocial structures and hierarchies. What they wish to actually do is not venerate it, they wish to remake it. It's like taking the Mona Lisa and sort of scribbling, you know, vandalism on it and then calling it a new system, a, a glorious ideal, new ideal of the future and what beauty should be and what nature should be and what art should be. And, and we all look at it, you know, aghast with a uh, complete horror and shock. You know, as Foucault stated, it's, it's, it's a heterotopia. It's, it's completely alien to all of our senses. And yet they still persist in it. They, they are mad. You're absolutely correct. There, there was a, there, I don't know if you ever remember Viz comic. But there was a cartoon com character in Viz comic years ago called Spoiled Bastard. And in every episode, Spoiled Bastard, he was a little kid and he used to go around with his mum. And no matter what his mum would do for him, he'd scream and roar and kick and cry and he'd throw a big tantrum and nothing was good enough. But I kind of get the Spoiled Bastard syndrome with all of this. That they're the errant child who's been spoiled rotten and has there's some kind of deep hate there you know what i mean it's almost like a hatred against nature there's a self-hate there too you know that behind all that hubris there's they can detect the nature in themselves i think first and foremost and they hate it it's a, there's almost like a self-destruction built into it somewhere you know, that they're an element of creation themselves and they actually fucking despise themselves deep down. And they will, you know, and, and that is probably, you know, one of the guys, I, I suspect, I suspect, or I, I'm guessing, one, one of the psychological motivations deep down, you know. And I don't know what, what has pushed that. Because, you know, you know, when you try and speak about these things, as you said to me before, pr to profile these people, but you try to put yourself in their mind space and try to think as they would think and guess, you know, to try and, I wonder what it's like for, for in that headspace, you know. And that's just a feeling I get that they, there's some rot in there, man, you know, there's, there's something unhealed, there's some deep scar there, there's something very old there as well, I get this sense of some ancient wound there, like, you know, that perhaps... If you went back far enough, you know, where they dethroned from some position or they lost something or something was stolen from them or they were it's just some some deep, deep wound. Oh yeah. It's like it's like it's like this ancient adversarial force. It's it is literally the Luciferic and Nostrum or the you know, the Promethean idea that they're constantly waging war against nature. They just can't live in, you know, pure beautiful abundance that nature provides. They can't do it. They have to destroy it. There's no harmony. They're, they're not able to live in harmony. End Absolutely. Of. But it's that, it's that, there's that other force, you know, you get that feeling when you think about these things and speak about th these things. Eventually you're, you're looking into beyond people and you do get, you know, you get into that other force. There's a, there's a shadow, there's a darkness, there's a spiritual element to this. It's satanic. It's whatever you want to call it. You know, it's Saturn. It's demonic, blah, blah, blah. It's the fallen angel. It's that which was cast out of heaven. It is it is the husks. It's the, you know what I mean? The cliffotic realms, the unwanted. They're, they're kind of the prolapsed elements within creation, the aborted aspects, the dark, unwanted, unclean sections of it that were cast away. It's like even, even the light casts a shadow, you know? They are the shadow. Yeah. The shadow.
Yeah. And and they're that's like the deep wound that they have. That they, they can never be the light. They can never be that higher yeah. other state. They can they're merely just projections. Shady, shadowy, right. uh, empty or hollow projections of of that higher state. I think obviously we're going into you know, I'm being fairly philosophical about it, but mm. I think honestly, and th- this is this is this. It gets back to this thesis antithesis. They do have that. I, I totally agree with what you've just stated in terms of the psychological profile you've put put forth regarding these people. Brilliant. That's. I think that's a failsafe that nature has put into uh, that adversarial force that seems to persist throughout the human condition. That failsafe, if that still persists, as I'm saying, and they don't sort of cut that umbilical cord to nature entirely. They still exercise the free will. They will destroy themselves. It's your state self-destruction. Right. I yeah, yeah. That makes sense, man. That makes sense. They need to have there needs to be a schism right down through the middle of nature where they cut themselves off so they're no longer a shadow cast by something greater than them. Yeah. They'll never do that. Because they like the free will. They see it's the it's sort of they're sort of between a rock and a hard place because to enjoy the pleasure and to even have the ego, because ego is a distortion of free will, you still have to have the root, which is the free will. Consciousness, if you sever that, if you become one of the Borg, you no longer enjoy the, the, the fruits of power. So they're in this ironic, ironic whirlpool. <clears throat> That's exactly it, yeah. So it will, I mean, it's only a matter of, I, I would say a hundred years, probably less. Three generations. Maybe 75 years. And these people will literally eat themselves. They're, even if it, gets, if it gets to that stage, I mean, we may, you may see external challengers because I think there's a, a lot of resistance, not just amongst the populations, with this sort of... Because it is, it is colonialism. This is colonialism perfected. Colonialism of the mind. I think there is a lot of people against it. Honestly. Because I think they see it. It's it's only going to reward a, a, a small clique. Again, they will regulate the peace because we'll be living in total dysto- a dystopian sort of eternal torment. And most people don't want that, as you were saying. Like it's totally antithetical to to our interests. So I honestly I wouldn't want to be them. That's that's all I would say on the matter. Silas, unless you, unless you want to, any other comment or. I think that was a very interesting conversation. Well, that was fascinating. I think that's been our best conversation thus far. That was fantastic. Well, I, I, I really I really enjoy that idea of looking into something. Uh, you know, I think it's, you know it's the when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. And sometimes when you discuss and you try to just get into into the headspace of what you're talk of some of the people you're talking about, it's sort it weirdly can open to you in a weird way it's like you see if you have a little kind of a psychic moment and you kind of channel that energy and it, it reveals itself to you but i think that's a really key thing that they're the shadow of the projection of something uh, greater and that 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 ironic you know they need that free will to experience the you know that the cocaine rush of 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 of, of the ego trip and in a, in a way that you know they need it, but they don't want it in them because it has put them into their. It it creates the shadow that they are, and is it it, it fills them with this kind of self hate as well. You know that they're second best and they're the castaway, the husk, the original husk or whatever. So it's very interesting. So I don't know. I just want to say thanks for talking to me tonight, and uh, oh, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic points, brilliant points you you brought. I always learn so much from these uh, conversations, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's awesome. Definitely, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, likewise, man. And anyone who's listening at this point, thanks for uh, listening to us. I hope you got something for us. We're definitely not working for the enemy, just in case you're wondering. Well, we think we're not. Who knows? Well, we do our best. <laughs> yes, we do. We do. <laughs>